business owner stuck in fear, doubt, and worry about what the marketplace will look like in the future, then this show is for you. Strap on your seatbelt and get ready to disrupt and innovate. Here's your host, Levy. Hello and welcome to today's episode. I am excited to introduce to you today, Brian Crum. He is a conscious capitalist and an Opportunity Zone fund expert who is passionate about sustainability. As the Vice President of Wealth Development at Caliber Companies, he helps successful business owners and real estate investors access wealth building strategies that were previously only available to institutions. Caliber specializes in private equity, opportunity zone funds, private lending, joint ventures, asset repositioning, note acquisitions, remodeling, and construction. Brian is also a founding board member of Sustainability Advisors, E-Alliances, and he is a C-suite network executive leader. As we've had conversations over the last couple of weeks about social entrepreneurship and ESG, I think you understand why Brian is going to bring an interesting perspective to our conversation on innovation. Brian, welcome. Lisa, thank you very much. It's really an honor to be on the show with you today. I am so glad to have you here with us. I did the formal stuff, that really introduction, but that doesn't really tell anybody anything meaningful about you. And you have a great story. Will you tell the audience about your journey and how you got to where you are today? Absolutely, Lisa. You know, a lot of times when someone says, tell me your story, uh, you have to think about how far back do I go? Uh, And I usually typically think about growing up on a farm in Ohio and what those experiences, you know, have led me to. So I grew up on a farm in, in Ohio, you know, rural area, small town parents. My mom was a school teacher. Uh, My dad was a mechanic. And when I think back on my journey to entrepreneurship, it literally didn't dawn on me until about 15 years ago that my dad was actually an entrepreneur. And the reason I say that is that when I was a little kid, you know, we'd get up, my dad would go to work. My mom stayed home with us and took care of us when my sister and I were going to school. And it didn't dawn on me until later that the reason that my dad had a job is that he owned a business. So he was a partner in an international truck dealership. So as a mechanic, uh, I just thought that he had a day job. What I didn't realize until much later that being a business owner, then owning our family farm where I grew up and where my family, uh, my parents still live, and then acquiring other farms along the way, that business owner and a farmer are some of the ultimate entrepreneurs because of how much risk there is in that. So uh, I didn't really realize what entrepreneurship was when I was growing up, but it dawned on me much later. Uh, after I got to Scottsdale, actually, which is a little bit later in the story here. So growing up, you know, on a farm, I always had a very strong interest in aviation and I thought I was going to be a pilot. So I thought, hey, it'd be great. You know, I was doing well in school. I could be an aeronautical engineer. And by the time I got to, to got to college, I realized that I didn't like math that much. So even, <laughs> even though I had started flying airplanes when I was 15 years old, uh, I remember that my mom would literally have to drive me to the airport because you can learn how to fly before you can drive. And so I started learning how to be a pilot, uh, did all my cross-country flights and was getting ready to get my license. And by that time, I'd already enrolled in school at Ohio State. And I remember I was going through an aviation management class and our instructor said, hey, I've got bad news for everyone that's sitting in this class. And keep in mind that this was back in the 1990s, so it was during the Gulf War. And he said, you know, those those kids that are getting their asses shot out overseas are going to come back and they're going to get the jobs that you're training for. And I thought, oh, geez. I'm not sure if uh, plan A is the direction I need to go. So at that point, I decided to pivot away from aviation and aeronautical engineering and ended up getting a business and a finance degree. So that's actually what I've been doing my entire career. It's been related to finance and investments. One of my very first jobs was at a a regional brokerage company, the Ohio company in Columbus, Ohio. And I worked with a lot of people that were business owners, helped them set up their 401ks, educate their employees about retirement planning. And then a couple of years into that, uh, this is back in 1997, my wife and I made a decision to relocate and move to Scottsdale, Arizona. So my journey throughout most of my adult career in business and finance, and then eventually entrepreneurship uh, really came about because my wife said, hey, let's go move to Scottsdale. And uh, it was just, you know, for the the weather and, uh, you know, housing affordability back at that time. So I started my career in Scottsdale, Arizona, and then a few years into that uh, career doing finance, 
working at different brokerage firms, including ING, which became Voya Funds, and then later for an independent advisory firm, I started learning what the challenges that entrepreneurs had. And I remember a really pivotal conversation I had where I was doing an enrollment meeting with a business owner, uh, helping bring a 401k plan and selling group insurance to these employees. And they only had five employees. And I remember thinking during that enrollment enrollment meeting, I asked the founder of the business, you know, what this was a great company. Uh, you guys have found a niche. Uh, you're providing something to the marketplace that didn't exist previously. Uh, it was actually a fintech company back in 2005 before fintech was even, you know, something that people talked about. And he said, we need money. And at that point, I made a couple of phone calls, was able to get them introduced to an investment group. The gentleman leading that group became their CFO. And they eventually ended up having a successful exit to a publicly traded bank. So I look back on that experience about asking that business owner, that entrepreneur, what are the challenges that you're facing? You know, what can we do to help? Um, And it didn't have anything to do with their insurance and their retirement plan. But as a result of that conversation, they quickly grew from five employees to 50 employees and then even more uh, became one of the first tech companies that moved into the Galleria, which is now kind of a hotbed for tech businesses in Scottsdale in particular. And what was able to come up that type of a conversation, you know, what can we do to help? Uh, So that's now the way I frame a lot of my conversations uh, with people. You know, you've got a great business, you've been very successful. What can we do to help you go to the next level? And it's a simple question. And it's such a meaningful one for the entrepreneur on the other side, because entrepreneurship is difficult. It's hard. (laughs) There's a reason why most people are not business owners. Most people are not entrepreneurs. They choose to take take the job of being an employee. There's also risks associated with that. You know, the risk of not being able to live the life that you want to be able to build the wealth that you want because you don't have direct control over your business and your life. And let's let's play with this a little bit. So I, I do want to point out that you said in your educational background, right, studying aviation and finance, but you weren't good with numbers. I, f- yeah. I find that funny, right? I mean, come on, Brian, really, there, you're great with there, numbers. There's a big difference between numbers from an engineering standpoint and numbers from a finance standpoint. And finance numbers are the ones that actually make sense to everybody, right? <laughs> Debits exactly. and credits Hopefully. are pretty straightforward. Yep. With all of this, with Caliber, you have joined a team and you've built a team that is doing really cool things. We talked to us a little bit about opportunity zones and what that means. Yeah, I, w- I want to go back to the story about why I decided to leave, you know, large company corporate America. I mentioned I, wor- I was working at ING, became it became Voya Funds. And then uh, a little bit later, I had actually joined the team at Merrill Lynch and became one of the financial advisors, made it through the, the training program, which is a uh, literally like a 95 to 98% failure rate. So if you can make it through that program, you've been able to, to get your get on a path of building up a business. But I didn't like the way that the wirehouse world, which is what traditional financial services uh, from an institutional standpoint is sometimes referred to. And what I didn't like about it was that I was not able to help a local business owner directly reinvest back into their own community. So when I met Chris Loeffler, the CEO and co-founder of Cal co-founder of Caliber back in 2014, I was at a point where I was disenfranchised with the Wall Street world and the way that firms like Merrill Lynch enabled the business owners in particular to invest and not have the ability to invest into real estate and to make meaningful investments back into the community. So I really like the mission of Caliber, which was to do exactly that. You know, work with successful folks, help them take the profits that they built within their own businesses or with even within their own real estate portfolio and invest directly back into their community. At that point, that community was mostly in Arizona. Since then, Caliber as a Scottsdale, Arizona-based real estate development and asset management company, we've expanded into multiple states, most significantly outside of Arizona, it's been into Colorado and Texas, which are also two very growth-oriented, business-friendly, lower tax, lower regulation states. And what we do specifically is we help someone invest their profits, whether it's from sale of the business or the ongoing income that they make that they might set aside for retirement or other purposes and invest it back into the into those communities through real estate. A couple examples, you know, building apartment complexes, taking an old um, underutilized facility and renovating it into a different use. Uh, and I'm going to give a couple examples of that later. 
But before I do that, I want to cover exactly what an opportunity zone fund is, because this is really where we started accelerating our path uh, as it related to uh, impact investing. So back in 2017, at the very end of 2017, Congress, within the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, incorporated uh, some language that created what are called opportunity zones across the whole country. Uh, what an opportunity zone is, is a designated census tract. There's over 8,600 of these across the whole country. About 180 of them are in Arizona. These are areas that were designated to have been left behind after other areas had recovered from the Great Recession those back in 2008, 2009, and 10. And the program was created to incentivize investors to invest back into those communities. And those communities typically, based on the 2010 census, and I know I'm getting a little deep in the weeds on this, but I think it's important for people to understand why these does, these opportunity zones were created and what the intent is so that when we talk about the success of the program and how Caliber and our other partners and investors have been participating in the program, you understand the direction it's coming from. So based on the 2010 census, the census, an opportunity zone fund, uh, an opportunity zone itself is either an area that was at 85% or below the average median income across the whole country or 20% or greater unemployment. So keep in mind that 2008, 2009, um, states like Arizona in particular were hit pretty hard. You know, we saw pullbacks of 50, 60% in the values of real estate, high levels of unemployment. So a lot of the state had become distressed. So when the program was created, Caliber looked at our whole business model. Where were we making local investments and were we meeting the requirements of the program, which was typically buy an existing property and make a pretty substantial improvement in it or invest directly into a business, either a startup or an existing business that needed uh, capital to grow. And when we saw what that looked like, we realized that we were already making those types of investments in what became Opportunity Zones. And at that point, we launched an Opportunity Zone fund, which made us one of the very first vertically integrated real estate companies in the country to launch an Opportunity Zone fund. And it, you know, it's a fabulous story and talks to right the idea of reinvesting into the local community, which you've already shared, right, is important to you, but it's important to our communities, right? The majority of small businesses fail in the first couple of years. And as we start talking about investing into opportunity zones, that's where some of our mom and pop entrepreneurs are at. And they are trying to figure out how to make all of this work. So will you tie this together for me a little bit with your perspective and your involvement at in conscious capitalism and how these things support one another, how these ideas yeah. support yeah, absolutely. I'm going to share a couple specific examples. Um, and before I do that, I want to tie in the story of how Caliber and myself and some of our other early investors and members of the community have been able to support other entrepreneurs. And that's through the creation of a company in a community called E-Alliances, which stands for Entrepreneurial Alliances. So Caliber was one of the first corporate sponsors of E-Alliances, which is a, a community-based organization to help entrepreneurs entrepreneurs align with other entrepreneurs. And through that program, we've been able to help people start, grow their businesses. You know, a successful business owner can get involved and become a mentor, an investor, a board member, just share their experiences and what they would have liked to have shared with other people that were starting their own businesses. And a portion of that is by implementing what are called co-working spaces. So inside of the Opportunity Zone program, one of my favorite adaptive reuse projects that Caliber has been involved with was is in downtown Mesa, Arizona. So for anyone not familiar with Mesa, it's the third largest city in Arizona. Uh, you've got Phoenix and Tucson, and then Mesa is the third largest city, and it's directly connected to both Tempe and Scottsdale. And the whole downtown core area, which is built around the light rail system, is actually now an opportunity zone. A few years ago, Arizona State University, one of the largest, most innovative universities in the country, has continued to expand, and they recently built a brand new tech campus 
with a focus on virtual reality, augmented reality, and other high-tech type of you know, visual arts-related enterprises. That particular expansion of their campus also brought more attention about why downtown Mesa was going to be a new innovative places for people to live, work, and play. So through that expansion, Caliber acquired about 30% of the buildings that were either vacant or underutilized in downtown Mesa. All of them were uh, right on the light rail system, which is the rapid transit system that connects Phoenix with Tempe with Mesa. And one of the renovations that we created was the very first department store in downtown Mesa. So that was converted into a co-working space. So you walk into this space now, there's, you know, dozens of business owners, entrepreneurs that are using that as a flexible working uh, space, uh, helping them start and grow companies. And then we can help bring the resources of alliances and other organizations that are really passionate about people uh, becoming successful through entrepreneurship. So that's just one of the examples that we're doing inside of the Opportunity Zone program to, to support entrepreneurship was actually building a new co-working space called Newberry Station because it was the JJ Newberry store, uh, which is kind of was like a local version of JC Penny. And we kept a lot of the historic nature, you know, the trazzo flooring, you know, the brick wall with wood and stuff like that. So you walk into this and it feels very hip, cool, and trendy, but it did keep a lot of the original character of the building built back in the, the 50s uh, in place. That's absolutely fabulous. And you know, the connection to the past, but making it useful for the future and Right. That whole community is focused on on innovation, and it's a it's a great story to highlight for this audience because it is a really wonderful e- example of how we put pieces of this puzzle that we're all talking about in being innovative and in being disruptive and challenging the status quo and making positive impacts. Caliber has been doing this for years now and tangibly changing communities. Yeah, there's Absolutely. there's another. Yeah, there's another example I want to share with you. I think literally it takes us to the next level on several different next level on several different levels, I guess. So the example is that inside of these opportunity zones, it does not have to be related to real estate. You can help people start and grow a business that's in an opportunity zone by making these substantial investments in them. So another example of a company that Caliber through our opportunity zone fund on behalf of our investors invested into is called Zenny Home. So Zenny is spelled Z-E-N-N-I. Uh, if anyone wants to learn more, they could just go onto the website. It's Zenny Home, Z-E-N-N-I Home.com. And you can learn more about the story of that. But Caliber identified that one of the ways that we wanted to make a positive impact in the community was creating more affordable and sustainable housing. You know, there is a shortage of affordable housing across the country. There's also issues with labor as it relates to construction and manufacturing. So uh, especially now that the economy is doing so well, even though we're heading into a recessionary environment, I think that Arizona is still sitting around, you know, two and a half to three percent unemployment. So there's just not a lot of available workers out there. Uh, so it has led to increases in um, inflation related to labor costs. But there's certain industries like construction and manufacturing that are doing very well. They just can't hire enough, enough people uh, to be able to keep up with the demand. So the example of Zenny Home and Caliber is that we invested into helping them build a brand new factory inside of what used to be the Navajo Generating Station, which at the time, when it was shut down several years ago up in northern Arizona in Page, which literally overlooks the Grand Canyon. It was one of the largest and dirtiest, most polluting coal-fired power plants in the country. So when the owners of that, which were multiple power companies in Arizona and California in particular, decided to shut it down and and make a shift to renewable energy, it left several hundred unemployed workers that were typically uh, Diné Navajo tribal community members. By building a factory at the site of that shutdown coal-fired power plant, we are now employing over 100 people that are now building homes in a factory that are then shipped on site, can be net zero off grid, or in the instance of what we're doing in downtown Mesa, building what's called Zen City which is going to be a six-story apartment building where these modular homes are literally stacked inside of a a steel framework uh, to build an apartment complex that is built faster, cheaper, 
and to a much higher quality uh, than if you did traditional stick building. So that's an example of innovation where we've helped create jobs and also addressing an affordable and and sustainable housing uh, issue at the same time. And it's a fabulous story with the audience. We've talked about all sorts of different things and there are I'm totally taking us on a tangent, Brian, but I'll bring us back, I promise, right? In past episodes, we've talked about the revolution with 3D printing, and we are actually seeing homes that are being 3D printed. The Zenny Home model is a variation of that, right, where the manufacturing, they're modular, but you're bringing it in. But right, we're challenging the way we've always done things. Construction doesn't have to be traditional stick, and it doesn't have to be tilt up. There are ways of doing things differently, and that's a great story. Thank you for sharing it. Yeah, absolutely. And because Caliber is a vertically integrated company, uh, we also are exploring how do we use other innovative methods of construction that may or may not, you know, have the the right fit with what we're doing with Zenny, um, including looking at other proven 3D printing companies. So I've, I've I've actually watched and walked through 3D printed homes, which is pretty cool. And I do I do know that there are several that are going to be built. Uh, entire communities are going to be 3D printed in areas. Arizona. And it's definitely something that we're taking a look at as well. Right. And so the mindset, right, it's a disruptive and innovative mindset to be willing to leave behind the things that are so comfortable and so familiar for all of the right reasons to make positive impacts. I get very excited about all of these things and it is also optimistic and great, but I'm guessing it's also not easy. Can you talk about some of the challenges and the roadblocks and the obstacles that you've overcome in these efforts that you've taken where you're seeing success, but I know that it wasn't a perfect path. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these things have taken so many years. I mean, um, you know, just looking back at the example of Zenny, uh, when we originally met with the uh, the founder and CEO, Bob Worsley in downtown Mesa, this was a couple of years before pandemic hit. And it was at the point where it was really just an IP play where, uh, you know, the person that had came up with the concept of this had got the patent put in place. And at the time, the plan was uh, that you had to build these overseas and ship them in because we just didn't have the, the right numbers, the the labor and the right situation to build these in America. And then the pandemic hits, which was great from the standpoint of being able to pivot away from international manufacturing and then shipping them in to being able to do actually not just made in America, but made in Arizona. So there's always different things that pop up. You know, you face one challenge and you use it to overcome another. Um, So that's one example where the path that the company started on several years ago significantly pivoted. And I think for many ways for the better for everyone, you know, other challenges are related to the fact that the construction industry in particular just has not been the most most innovative. If you think about the way that the majority of homes are built, it's still the same as it was, you know, I don't want to say a century ago, but, you know, decades and decades ago, people have been building a home, you know, ground up on site. And if you think about the difference about why don't you build a car in your garage, why are you building a house on your lot? Um, And it's because the answer was that's the way we've always done it. Uh, So if you look at innovation and and using Europe as an example, um, Europe has been on the forefront of sustainable, uh, affordable, um, high quality, modularly and penalized construction for decades. Uh, So part of what Caliber is doing is we look at what has worked in Europe. How can we look at that and bring that type of technology, these those types of resources over to America, in particular in Arizona, and then uh, utilize those those proven techniques and some of the challenges related to local zoning, getting on board with the architects and the engineers that have to understand what these new to America, but you know, proven in Europe or other parts of the world technologies are. And fortunately, younger, younger folks in particular in architecture and engineering want to be innovative. Uh, They want to find solutions. I mean, it's a very solutions-based, problem-solving type of business. So fortunately, we've been able to partner with those folks, uh, look at what's been proven either overseas and bring them to America. And and sometimes those could be incorporated into what we're doing in construction and development inside of Opportunity Zones. And I love, Brian, how you're able to layer everything back together, right? This is a giant jigsaw puzzle and you're putting together all sorts of nice pieces to create a better, more sustainable outcome for the future, right? For the improvement of communities as a whole. 
when you stop and look at where you're at, looking towards the future, what are some of those things kind of out at the horizon and beyond that you're looking forward to bringing into fruition? Yeah, this is where the concept of sustainability can really go full cycle when it comes to construction development. So there's one thing about looking at how do I more efficiently operate, manage, and produce power for a building. So kind of the easy steps to that were make them energy efficient, put on renewable energy, usually solar onto the building. But now everyone is looking at what can we do that takes it to the next level, including, you know, designing from the very beginning to be energy efficient, even to the point where the majority of buildings built in the future potentially will always produce more power than they consume. But more importantly than that, what can we do to reduce the amount of water and power and carbon emitted in the design, uh, transportation, and construction of those properties? Um, So I definitely see how uh, more natural plants whether it's trees or hemp, uh, which I see a lot of potential for hemp to be able to use from an industrial standpoint. If you look back at the history of hemp in America, uh, a lot of people assume that the reason you couldn't grow hemp, you know, based on some federal restrictions was related to its use related to uh, marijuana. Um, it's, it's actually not true. Uh, if you look back into the 1920s and 30s, the main reason why hemp was outlawed as a crop was related to the entrenched powers to be that lobbied Congress um, and said, we don't want hemp to compete with cotton. So now, several years ago, the federal government allowed hemp to be grown as a crop, uh, now has the same support funding insurance as any crop, including corn. And so right now, the big biggest impediment to hemp as an industrial crop related to um, construction materials because of how strong it is, um, as well as textiles, is that we don't have the processing capacity, the processing infrastructure. So we can grow hemp, but we don't necessarily have the right processing capabilities to turn it into construction materials, whether it's something called hempcrete, which is a lower energy, lower water usage, lower carbon consumption compared to traditional concrete, or binding it into construction materials, including structural panels. So I think that we're gradually getting to the point where the industrial processing capacity that exists in other countries like Australia are now being brought to America. So I definitely see in the future how hemp, which is actually actually has some benefits for the soil. Uh, It captures carbon uh, versus emitting it like steel and concrete does, uh, could become a a future source for uh, renewable and sustainable construction materials. Um, And I I do see a way that that can be incorporated into what companies at Caliber are doing in the future when it comes to uh, energy efficient, uh, carbon negative construction materials. That future look is fabulous. And again, Brian, you've tied together so many things in in terms of our our focus on sustainability and looking at things that are being done in other countries. And we traditionally consider the United States to be innovative and in lots of ways we are, but there are lots of ways we haven't been. And it's time that more people are willing to look outside of what is traditionally accepted here and bring in things that actually, again, make those impacts. And another great example for all of that. For our audience today, Brian, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story and all of the different ways that we can combine ideas that are innovative across industries, across platforms, leverage them together that make an actual impact in real communities. Thank you so much for being with us today. Lisa, it's really great being on the show with you today. And for my audience, don't get left behind. Join me next time. That's it for today's episode of Disrupt and Innovate. Head over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. Every single week, one lucky listener that posts a review on iTunes will win the grand prize drawing, a $15,000 private VIP day with Lisa Levy. And be sure to head over to disruptandinnovate.com and get your free copy of Lisa's gift. And join us on our next episode.